Dear friends, good morning and welcome. So glad that we're able to worship together, both in person and um, virtual as well. And so it's nice to be getting back to normal um, and we begin, begin our worship.
Welcome to sunny Tucson, Arizona. As our cool mornings in the 40s turn into the warm sunshine, beautiful skies, and clear night, uh, 70s in the afternoon, uh, I offer you this prayer to my wonderful friends at Prince of Peace. Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have given to us. We know that everything we have comes from you. Help us to use these blessings to help others. As we slowly recover from the current pandemic, we pray for all those affected by the COVID virus. We pray for stability in our society and in our families. We pray for your loving arms and comfort. We pray that we can show our love and be a comfort to others. Help us to reach out to help our neighbors. Help us to stay close to our families and friends and not drift apart. Help us to be less self-centered in our relationships and to give when we identify other people's needs. I pray that you will always walk beside us and give us the power and strength to endure life's hardships and trials. We also pray for common sense among our government officials, and we ask that you help us to remember that our government is simply a government of men and women and not our main focus, which is your heavenly kingdom. Help us to keep this in perspective. We pray for Greg and for Deanna and for all those on our prayer list. And I pray, as I normally do, that you will help us to have courage, to hold on to what is good, to honor all men, to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to help the suffering, and to share the gospel. All these things, dear Lord, we pray in your holy name. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning heart I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling blocks to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He poured out all of the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. You know, as we've lived in different cities over the years, it seems like when folks visit, there's always some site or, or event that they want to take in while they're there. In Atlanta, it was usually the Coke Museum or, or maybe the Atlanta Underground. 
Here in Cleveland, though, it's often been the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. To me, going once was enough, but from time to time, we'll take friends who are visiting from out of town to check it out. And when you go, they have almost everything that you can think of. They have Jim Morrison's fifth grade report card. He got straight A's, and the teacher said he showed great promise. There's a couch from Jenny, Jimi Hendrix's boyhood home in Seattle that he began playing the guitar while singing upon. Kurt Cobain's death certificate. And there was a special display this one year they were there, we were there, and it was about the band Led Zeppelin. And one of their big songs was called Stairway to Heaven. In fact, some consider it perhaps the finest rock song ever written. The words begin, there's a lady who knows all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to try to sing it for you. But the thing that really struck me was the interpret interpretation of the lyrics. You know, what does the song mean? Well, the theme of stairway to heaven is, is spiritual liberation. It's the liberation of the soul as it makes the long journey through hell and the physical realm upward to the higher spiritual planes. The song reflects that human values will turn from selfish desires towards universal love and the evolution of the soul. Now, buying a stairway to heaven does not mean that it's something that can be purchased. Rather, it points to the great cost involved in any great spiritual quest. It speaks of shadows which are sins or negative energy that taint the purity of the soul. And as we walk the road of enlightenment, the shadows will at times tower over us. But that will, redu will reduce as we draw closer to the true light. Drawing on Norse and Celtic mythology, the song speaks of two paths we can follow. The path of human desire, or we can listen to the voice of the soul and follow the path towards the eagle which represents freedom for earthly bounds. The journey of the stairway to heaven is a long one, but the spirit which leads us in our quest is always there, reminding me that there is purity of the soul. The analogy with the metal gold is a reminder that it is pure, permanent, and remains untarnished, and that is the ultimate aim of the soul. Finally, the lady is always there, creating the opportunity for all seekers to take the path of liberation of the soul. That's deep. You know, and here all these years, I just thought it was a good song, had a good beat, and was easy to dance to, but what do I know? Now, you made me wonder, why did I take you down this path of memory lane? When confirmation this year, one of the topics we were planning on covering was Luther's theology of the cross. And I thought that might be something fun to talk about today. I realize that that's probably not the most exciting topic in the world. And perhaps you're thinking that, well, isn't theology something left to pastors and professors? But the truth is, every single one of us is a theologian because theology is simply thinking stuff about God. And that's something we all do. I mean, you might go days without giving a thought towards God, but then something might happen, maybe an accident, tragedy, death, disaster, loss, suffering, some wrongdoing, or sometimes good things happen. Great beauty or pleasure, just sheer grace, chance encounters, love, we begin to wonder. You know, we might cry out in agony, why God? Or we might cry out in relief or delight, thank you, God, thank you. But sooner or later, we're likely to think about God and wonder if there's any kind of meaning or logic in our lives. And when we do that, we become theologians. And that's not something to take lightly because theology can be a curse or a blessing. And so the question becomes, what kind of theologian are we going to be? 
According to Luther, there's only two theologies. There are theologies of glory, and there is a theology of the cross. You might think, well, as Christians, I mean, we're automatically theologians of the cross. And certainly the cross is everywhere in churches. We see the cross, we sing about the cross, we wear the cross around our neck, pastors talk about the cross, but it's not necessarily true. There's a theology of the cross, but there's also a theology about the cross, what Luther called the theology of glory. And here, in the theology of glory, we start to try to start from above. We try to sit up in heaven with God and look at it and try to figure out what does it mean? Or how does it work? Or what does this cross symbolize? And it's seeking to understand what God in heaven is up to as Jesus dies on the cross. And the theology of the cross begin, about the cross begins with the glory story. And a theology of glory begins with the myth of the entrapped soul. The story it tells might be told in the stairway to heaven, but the idea is that the spiritual is, physical is bad, the spiritual is good. And the human struggle is that we are trapped on this earth, trapped in these bodies longing to be free. And so there, there is a path, a stairway, a series of steps, or some simple knowledge that will help us and guide us and give us the power to ascend the glory road. Now, as Christians, we might do that by beginning with the story of an Adam and Eve. And what do we call the events there? When human beings ate from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, we call it the fall. We were up here, a little lower than the angels, and what happened? We have fallen down the stairs. And ever since, we've been trying to work our way back to the garden, to that place of of oneness with God. But we have problems. We are weakened, we are weighed down, and so we need some help along the way. And here's where the cross comes into play for a theologian of glory. On the cross, we might say, Jesus climbs the ladder for us. We're too sinful. We're too weak. And so in Lent, we sing all kinds of wonderful songs about being weak and potent and blind. Why we would want to sing about that, I don't know. But anyway, in any case, the cross is seen as Jesus doing something that we cannot do ourselves. Or Jesus taking our place because somebody has to climb the stairway. And if that's too negative for you, the cross is seen as an example or an inspiration that will give us the strength, the grace to follow Jesus up that stairway. But the bottom line is that we are down here. And if we could only find the way, we're longing for God. We're longing to be free. And we would get back on the path. And you can see that theology of glory not only in how some tell the story of the cross. I mean, that's essentially the, the message of that song that I was sharing. You see it in Buddhism's eightfold path of enlightenment, Islam's five pillars. Hinduism's rebirth and reincarnation, you know, in all of them, there's this quest that we were on, some, something that we are seeking. But a theology of glory is always looking to somehow figure out a way around suffering and death. In the gospel lesson for last Sunday when Pastor Carl was here, for example, we see his disciple Peter, an exact, an excellent theologian of glory. What does he do when Jesus starts talking about going to Jerusalem to be arrested, to be killed? What is Jesus' first reaction? He says, God forbid that should ever happen to you. And what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. You are on the side, not of God, but of men. Several weeks ago, we looked at the story of the transfiguration. You remember Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a mountain. There was dazzling light. There was a word from God. And what is Peter's first reaction? Lord, it is good that we are here. 
I'll build three shelters and we can just stay here forever. But Jesus descends down the mountain, right back into the pain, the heartache of the world. So what's wrong with the theology of glory? I mean, why shouldn't we try to climb the, the stairway to heaven? Well, the main problem is it's built on a lie. Going back to the story of Adam and Eve, the story we normally call the fall. What's really going on there? Remember, in the beginning, the man and the woman are created, and they are created to receive life and love from God, and they are to return that by giving glory to God as they serve one another and care for creation. Simple, straightforward, to live in that reflecting relationship with God. But what does the serpent whisper in the ear? Did God really say you shouldn't eat from the tree? You know, why would God say that? Is God holding out on you? I mean, you don't need God. Try it, you'll like it. I mean, when you actually read the story, it sounds more like a coup than a fall. And so sin is not some desire of the flesh dragging the soul down to earth. Rather, it's saying to God, thanks, but no thanks. I'm in charge, and I'll do it my way. And the theology of the cross is in a fight to the death with that theology of glory or stairway to heaven, the theology about the cross, whatever you might call it. Because rather than looking at the cross from above, or from a distance looking on as spectators and trying to figure out what does it all mean and how might it apply to my life. Rather, the theology of the cross looks at it as God's strange works in the eyes of Luther or the foolishness of the cross, to use the words of St. Paul in our lesson for this morning. Because when you think about it, the cross makes no sense to our way of thinking. In fact, it's just the opposite. What does Jesus do? He doesn't climb. Jesus doesn't count equality with God as something to be sought after. Rather, he humbles himself and becomes obedient, even to death on a cross. Rather than climbing, Jesus descends. He comes in lowliness. He dies forsaken and alone. He is mocked and beaten, spit upon, nailed to a cross, and killed. And there is not a single thing attractive about Jesus on the cross that we would seek him out. In the end, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The heavens are silent, and Jesus breathes his last, and he is swallowed up in the unknown of death and darkness. A theologian of the cross calls a thing what it is. And that begins by affirming that, first of all, Jesus was not doing anything in his death but dying. He wasn't paying off God. He wasn't giving an example that we are to follow. He was dying. You know, a theology about the cross makes it seem as if Jesus was really doing something else, as though his death had some other meaning than just death. And I suspect the real reason for the theology of glory or stairway to heaven is that we cannot bear the thought of death as the end, of death as death. Because the frightening thing about death is that in and of itself it has no meaning. Death is the victory of darkness and nothingness. Death is that loss of ultimate, ultimate loss of control. You know, I don't know about you, but I cannot bear to think that one day I am going to die and I am going to disappear and the world's not going to skip a beat. I cannot imagine a world without me in it. But there are no escape hatches. There is no way around the grave. And I don't like that. That is not fair. In fact, it's terrifying. I mean, that makes me feel helpless, hopeless. But that is what happened to Jesus. He was crucified, died, and was buried. And so it will be for you and me. 
You know, Ash Wednesday is always one of the more poignant days in the, in the church year for me. People come forward, a cross is traced on our foreheads. We receive the ashes of our mortality, and we hear the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In almost every single year of my ministry, there has been at least one person that I have marked with the ashes who I have then gone on to bury in the following year. One day, that will be me. If that were all we had to say about death, then it would be better left unsaid. But as theologians of the cross, that is only the first word. It is not the last word. Because Jesus has claimed us out of death, he has claimed us for life. Because Jesus didn't come to improve the improvable or enlighten the enlightenable, Jesus came to raise the dead. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for you. That is the faith. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the wisdom and it is the power of God. And to God be the glory. Amen. We love because God first loved us. Our offerings are always a response to the great and gracious love poured out for us on the cross that Jesus desires to gather us in, to take us from death to life with him. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. 
Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And friends, the body of Christ, given for you. In the blood of Christ, shed for you.
Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.